Gardner, we are glad that you've joined us. Welcome to the show. And we're here to talk about plants and all kinds of things in the garden, in the indoor garden even. So I hope you will stay tuned. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois. So I'll answer plant material questions, um, plant, you know, maybe cut flowers and perennials. But we have three talented folks here as well. So let's find out who they are, their expertise, and maybe hear a show and tell or a email question. Let's start first with you, Dr. Doug Williams. Hello everybody, I'm Doug Williams. I'm a postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Recreation, Sport and Tourism at the University of Illinois. And my background is horticulture and landscape architecture. So I will uh, welcome questions about woody plant material and care and a number of other things uh, concerning horticultural plants. Okay, now, what have you got to show us? Well, we're going to do the show and tell first, or if we're going to do the If you want to, yes, well, that'd be fine. Okay, for the show and tell, I brought in um, cornice moss, which is cornelian cherry. Um, it's a very um, early blooming small tree. Um, it doesn't get as much uh, interest as the uh, forsythia, but it still is a close second. It's done pretty well. This year it has usually younger green branches and the cluster of flowers uh, right at the base of, or at the, the nodes of the stems, uh, you'll see uh, they're quite yellow. So they're quite proficient and profuse in their blooms. And this is um, something nice to have. You can even bring it indoors uh, and have it uh, bloom earlier if, it's, um, as it, if it hasn't already started to bloom um, early in the spring, pretty close to the same time as uh, Forsythia. Um, and it's one of my favorite trees. It has also some nice berries come fall season. Uh, I think some of the animals like it too, but um, a very attractive small tree and early bloomer. Question. You said that you can bring it in as a cut plant. Uh, yes. How much cold weather does it have to get before you can cut it off and get it to bloom inside? Oh, well, I don't know that exactly. Usually I, I would, um, if you're thinking well, can you, you know, cut it off like in late January, early February and get it to? Sure. Uh, January is good. February is fine. Um, I'm not sure if you need to wait. You can even possibly do it in December, but usually you're looking at hollies and other things that are uh, sort of in season and a part of that sort of uh, red and green combination that people uh, find so attractive. But once the new year comes, I think yellow uh, tends to be the, uh, the spring color and it's of, uh, of interest up to most people. Thank you. And we were really studying that. It has no frost damage that we can tell. Well, Doug can tell, yeah. but we couldn't tell. It looks yeah. really good. Yeah, but I think just because of the petals, and the, it's a small cluster of flowers, even if they are, um, have some, some dieback or burn because of this season, you end up still having a, an attractive um, display uh, at a distance. But if you get close, you can see that they aren't as uh, uh, succulent as they could possibly be, but well, it works. It works. It looks good. Thanks for bringing that in. And now let's go to you, Kelly Alsup. Okay. Hi. My name is Kelly Alsup, and I am a horticulture educator. I serve Livingston, McLean, and Woodford counties. I work for Extension. Um, my expertise lies in greenhouse management and indoor plants. However, I love to talk about beneficial insects and pollinators. Uh, I actually brought in a cool show and tell today and you're like, oh Kelly, that's just a white <laughs> piece of cloth. Well, this white piece of cloth can really help you in the garden. What it is, is it's called floating row covers or frost cloth. And you put this over your plants and it will actually um, warm the plants between two and five degrees, which could be very beneficial if you're going to plant some of those cool weather crops out a little bit earlier. It could give you a jump start. But another uh, application that I have for these row covers is to keep insects off. And um, <clears throat> for instance, when I plant squash, I will cover this so those squash plants, those tiny squash plants with this row cover, floating row cover, for the first six weeks. And that will actually prevent the squash bugs from laying eggs on the plant. It allows in about 
80 to 90 percent of the sunlight. It allows in airflow and um, allows in water. So it actually can be really quite beneficial. And it's much safer for your plants than say a plastic. A plastic might heat the plant too much up, too, too high in the sun. And then plastic can also keep in the moisture and not have good air circulation. So if we do have, you know, this crazy Illinois winter, which we seem to be having, and you get out in there early and we do have some more late um, cool weather, you can use this to cover up your crops and save about five degrees. But then when you start planting your other crops and you wanna save them from the insects and you don't wanna spray chemicals, you can cover those crops for six weeks with this. Once they uh, start flowering, you probably need to take this off for pollination. I grew the best cabbage ever <clears throat> by covering with floating row cover. No insects, no larva. It was great. It is the best way. And you know, once you take it off, those plants are big and healthy oh, and they're able amazing. to fend off some of those insects. Okay, How long do you thank keep you. that cloth on there? I mean, to keep the insects from... Uh, you keep it on as long as you can. Oh, okay. uh, like squash, you know, as soon as it starts flowering, you want the pollination to occur. But with her cabbage, she could have kept it on the whole entire crop. I did. But I'd peek under, and then when mm -hmm. I took it off, I went ahead and cut it because I didn't want the insects right, then but, to come on. You know, it was great. later on in the season, if an insect were to lay eggs, it would be it would not cause such a damaging population. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I have a self-pollinating zucchini that I can leave it longer <clears throat> under the row cover, but only if you get one that says self-pollinating. Okay, we could talk about this forever, but let's not because we're gonna go on to Jim Schuster. Hi, I'm a retired uh, plant pathologist and horticulturist from the University of Illinois Extension, uh, and I have um, um, an email asking about um, oyster shell scale on ye American yellowwood, and uh, oyster shell scale is one of the most common insects in the entire world. It's common in anything but a very uh, tropical jungle and in Antarctica, but it's found in every state of the uh, state of the U.S. or country of the U.S. And it's more common in northern states than in the southern states. Mm. It attacks 128 kinds of plants. It overwinters as an egg on her mom's dead body, mm. uh, and therefore uh, it's a little bit harder to, you know, can't uh, work, um, get too many insect controls on them at that time and kill it. Uh, luckily for us, we only have one generation in Illinois. Depending on the host and uh, farther south you may go, you may get two generations a year, which means that the damage is even faster, because this insect can kill your plant. Okay. <coughs> Um, this uh, has some natural enemies, basically uh, mites and the toy stab ladybug. However, they never show up until you have severe damage. So if you're trying to avoid the damage to the point of almost having a dead plant, you need to treat the insect. And you're going to treat in late May in the uh, central part of Illinois. You're going to treat late, uh, a little bit later in northern Illinois and a little bit sooner in southern Illinois. Uh, you're going to uh, use uh, several different possible chemicals. It's one, not all of these. It's acetate, which is also sold as orthene, uh, by phenethrin, carbaryl, which is also sold as seven, cyfluorethrin, or pyrethrin. However, for the organic gardeners, we also have clove oil or insecticidal soap. So those are some of your possibilities. So it would be, you know, for the central part, late May? Late May. And so you add go, about two weeks for, er, you know, earlier for right. southern Illinois, two weeks later for northern Which Illinois. Which could be across Indiana and, yeah. and into, so into Michigan it would be early, it would be um, later. Well, in Michigan you got to look at how close you are to the Lake Michigan. To the lake, yes, yeah. that's true, that's true. Okay, thank you. Boy, that sound, that was really thorough. That was good to know all that. Well, today I received my onions. And so I brought them in because I thought you may not have seen onion plants. Some people get them this way. You can also get them as bulbs. But these particular ones, um, they happen to be the variety of copra, C-O-P-R-A, and red zeppelin. And these are really good keepers. 
I'm going to wait a few days until it warms to the 50s and then just plant them as shallow as I can and still have them you know do well and I'll probably put them four or so inches apart to try to get the bulb to fill in and the ones I still have a few from last year I have red zeppelins that I haven't used and they are that good a keeper so I've never had them you know actually last nine months some of them ten so anyway think about onions but you can get them as a bulb and do green onions or you can have them as a plant and of course you can do seed but you should have done that in January February okay getting ready for the garden well let's go to a did you know a short little segment next garlic is a member of the onion family there are both hard neck and soft neck varieties of garlic hard neck garlics have long stalks while soft neck garlics do not Okay, let's go to the phone lines, and we're going to start with Jean's question on line two, and it's about rhubarb. Hi, Jean. Are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I sure can. What's your question? Okay, I actually have about three questions. One is my rhubarb was sprouted, and it's, now it's got real cold, and uh, should I cut that off in order to let the other's new good stuff to come through? And another question would be... Uh, should I, I have a growth on there like a, uh, looks like a seed pod, which they say you're supposed to cut off, but it looks like a little egg or something coming up out of the top of them. And should I cut that off or when I should cut it off? Okay. So who wants to jump in on rhubarb? Well, I know you're not supposed to eat it after it freezes because what is it? Uh, is it oxalic acid? I believe that's right. That builds up in the leaves. So and it comes into the stem. Yeah, so, it, I think it's only for about three weeks or a month after that, and then you can. It, but it may probably be safer to cut it off. It's just it really that wrong. stalk, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would cut it. I would just cut off the damaged leaves and let the new growth bring come up. Yeah. Now, if it does look like a seed <clears throat> pod, uh, that really keeps the growth away from the leaves and stalks. So you might just wait to see if it is going to be a seed head, and then, as soon as you can tell, remove that unless you really don't want the stalks. But most people want to grow it for the, the stalks. But it does take away from the leaves. Okay, so that is, that's going to be nothing left. <laughs> but anyway, you can wait to make sure it's a seed head. I think he had another question, but I didn't hear it. Uh, that was now to winterize. Should a guy okay. cut the tops off the rhubarb before it freezes over, or should he just let the winter kill off and then take them off? You know, I let the winter kill mine off, and then I removed it. It's, I don't and know if that's the way I should. Sometimes a lot of people will, you know, mulch their rhubarb a little bit to help it go through mm -hmm. the winter. But, yeah, well, I'd let it just <clears throat> kill off the leaves. I, I never remove my dead leaves in the fall. I let them freeze and just lay there until spring and then clean them up in the spring. Mm -hmm. I actually haven't done anything to mine, but yeah. I, I mulch mine <clears throat> all the time. And so I might have to get out there and look. I haven't looked at mine <laughs> since the frost, so we'll have to see. Well, Jean, thank you for those questions about rhubarb. I'm looking forward to that. And rhubarb and strawberries together. Oh, that's going to be great. Well, thank you so much. Now let's go on to Sherry's question on line three, and I think it's about a poinsettia. Hi, Sherry. Hello. And what's your question? We have a, poin a poinsettia. It's four years old. We, we take it out in the good weather. We bring it in in the leg room in the winter. It blooms every year. Wow. It's five foot high oh. and about five foot wide. Wow. Should It's getting awfully leggy and it's dropping leaves. Hmm. I wonder who that question is for. We're all looking at <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> Well, um, congratulations for keeping a poinsettia really? going for four years. We usually, in the greenhouse industry, just throw those poinsettias away once we are done with them during the holiday season. Um, it's probably dropping leaves because it's not getting enough sun. I would um, either cut it back or throw it away and buy a new one. <laughs> because poinsettias really keep the greenhouse industry going during the winter. I love supporting my industry 
and we really want you to come back and buy a new poinsettia every year. But if you uh, really want to keep a hold of this, I would just cut it back to a node, which is where the leaf meets the stem, and it will grow new leaves and become bushy. But really, that is amazing to have yes. one that looks that good mm -hmm. <laughs> that, and that big. It's blooming too. That, that's, uh, that's it's really good. <laughs> So keep that and then buy a new one every year <laughs> and have competitions. Oh, well. <laughs> okay, say thank you, Sherry. And let's go on to a lilac question. Cheryl's got one for us on line four. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, how are you tonight? Doing great. How are you? I'm fine. I would like to plant, and I believe this is what it's called, a French lilac cotton candy. Do you know what I'm talking about? They're a darker pink at the end towards the stem, and then as it goes out to the end of the flower, it becomes white. Sounds beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, but I live in Iroquois County, and I was wondering, am I in the right zone for this? Doug, we're looking at you. Yeah. I would say, I think it's okay. I mean, lilacs are pretty tough, and um, I would just make sure you prepare the soil. Um, you want it to have some uh, organic material. Uh, you want it to not be too clay. Uh, clay so it's not um, it's well drained but it should hold water um, you can mulch around it to make sure it keeps enough moisture there um, especially since it's going to be a new plant because um, we don't know what the season is going to be like this year so it could be very <laughs> wet and cold or it could be uh, some sparse periods of no rain but you want to be um, aware of how to care for it over that time but I, I think you're fine with planting one it'll be a an attractive plant. Yeah. I gotta find out about this yeah. one. Yeah, that sounds really good. She's gotta call the, back next year and tell us how Yes, did you sure. hear that? Send Cheryl, you picture. have to call back. <laughs> I would look up the zone hardiness and if you're if it's zone five then you're I good. I can't imagine a lilac yeah. like that's not a zone five and some might be four, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. north. Even better. So, yeah. So, well, anyway, report back. That's what we want to do, for, want you to do for us. Let's yeah. go to Mary's question on line five about radishes. Hi, Mary. Hi, how are you? Doing great. Good. Uh, yes, my question is about radishes. I have no luck in raising radishes. When's the best time to plant them and how to plant them and to keep them from going to tops? Okay, so we, we might all jump in on this, but <clears> early, <throat> is better. Not frozen uh, soil, but as early as you can possibly get in. The heat makes them go to all tops. And um, also how close do you put your seed? Because they need to be three good. inches apart. So if you're not thinning, you're going to have plants that are too close to make the radish itself. So if you plant them, you know, like a row too close, you have to be willing to thin them to three inches apart. Uh, Jim, I am not willing to thin, so I go <laughs> out of my way to plant them farther apart. I yep. really can't. Uh, well, that's what I did too. But, I know. really can't stand to thin because I feel like I should, I'm wasting it. So yep. I just plant them a, an inch and a half maybe apart because yep. I will take the little one in between and eat those and let the other ones get oh. a little bit bigger. But I think usually they want to have it cool and spaced. Yeah. And you got well watch, drained. And one other thing, you've got to watch how long you let them grow because the longer you let them grow past 30 days, the hotter they get. So unless you like really hot radishes, you know, look at how they, uh, from when they start coming up to the maturity. Mm -hmm. that, when you go past that maturity date, they get hot. Because they are 25 to 35. It's yeah. really, don't let them go 40. It's right. dangerous <laughs> to your mouth <laughs> unless that's you know, what you want. So try it again and go earlier. I mean, I may try some this weekend. Yeah, you know, And then March. succession planting for a little bit. And I mm -hmm. put them in with carrots too. So I, I radishes end up everywhere in my garden. <clears throat> uh, so try that. Okay, let's go to a clematis question, or you can say clematis if you want to. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to Linda's question on line six. Hi, Linda. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question. Can I divide some of my clematis? Okay, what kind no. do you have? Well, I don't know their names. But uh, um, <laughs> do they have... flower in the spring? Yes, yes. Do they flower on old wood or do they come up from new? Uh, old wood. Okay. All right. Now we've got that. Is there a lot at the base? Does it look like there's something to divide? 
not really because that most of that see i don't cut them down Mm -hmm. in the fall and most of that looks pretty scrubby and brushy and i do cut some of it out but not all of it because i get leaves and blooms on that Mm -hmm. i wouldn't really consider clematis a perennial that you divide couldn't she almost um try layering it that would be Really? And by layering, we mean bend mm. one of them down and, you know, do a little bit of a scratch on it, you know, wound it, and then that is not separated from the mother plant, but, you know, put a stake or a rock or something that gets it in contact constant with yeah. Yeah. contact with the soil. Yeah. So you might try layering it, but usually there's nothing to see to, to divide. But you might try layering. I know Larry showed uh, he's <coughs> Eastern Grounds Garden forever. He layers everything, and I think it's so fun, and so I've started to do that. So try it and report back to us, because you'll get additional plants. But I think, like you said, I don't think there's much to divide. I mean, you could always do cuttings. Yes, could be cuttings. With and, the tips. And I've gotten seed-grown things, but they don't always come true. Right. But it's always fun to have the seed ones as well. Okay, thank you so much for your calls. Now we're going to go back around and do an uh, email, and we'll start with you, Doug. All right, well, we've got it from one of our viewers, <coughs> and they are asking about a red bud. They said, I have a red bud plant, and it was planted in uh, 2011. It's grown for five years pretty slowly, and after um, those five years, it uh, started to send up a lot of uh, sprouts at the base of the main stem. This is quite common in red bud, um, and there are a lot of small trees, even um, malice or the uh, crab apple uh, is similar. Uh, it's just a, a characteristic of the plant, um, so there are a lot of sports or sprouts that will come up, and you want to cut those away. Uh, that's the question, how do you prune that? Yeah, you need to cut those away so you have the character of a small tree with a central or maybe multiple branches, maybe three, but if you have a single branch, maintain that. Um, because what will happen is you will get included bark. Um, basically, the, um, the branches will start to cross and they'll girdle, um, which will end up possibly even damaging the tree as far as death or even in, um, diseases or insects will attack it. So get you, get you a nice um, saw or a pr- set of pruners and um, make it a, a spring <laughs> activity or even in the fall time too because they'll send them up uh, continuously throughout the year. Um, so you just have to continue to do that. It's not something that's going to go away. Okay. Thank yeah. you for that. And now Kelly. Okay. My question is about <clears throat> ants in the house. Um, she wants to know if mulch and leaves outside are actually contributing to the problem and if she should remove that. <clears throat> Actually, ants are extremely beneficial to soil. They aerate the soil. So you shouldn't want to get rid of the ants. Now, when they come in your house during the winter, yes, that can be a big problem. She has cats and she doesn't want to spray. So uh, one of the things that must be done is you must find where the nest is. And that could be in the walls. Um, One of the things that they say to do is spray vinegar on them, but it only temporarily causes them to go away. Um, You you have to use either the ant baits or ant liquid, and the ant baits take a little bit longer to act, and the liquid is much faster, but you have to, that pesticide goes back to the queen and kills them off. Okay. Can I add one thing to that? Uh, I, when I was working up north, I found that a lot of the ants that came into the house in the winter were under a slab house. Mm-hmm. It made it a little bit harder to get at them. So, I see. Um, but you still control me what you recommended. Okay, very good. Mm. Do you have a quick question, Jim, to answer? Yes. Okay. I have a pear tree that's been in the ground for 10 years and developed a white growth at the base. They want to know if it's uh, going to cause a problem. Yes. I think it is wood rot. Uh, it's hard to tell from the picture exactly uh, if it is, but based on the appearance <coughs> in the picture, I would say yes. But I'm going to recommend 
since you live in Bartlett, that you take a sample down to Richard Henschel when he's either in the DuPage County Extension Office or in his Kane County Extension Office and have him verify a sample you take to him. And if you want to also try sending the sample to the plant clinic down here in Champaign, you can do that too. But I'm pretty sure you got wood rot and based on the picture, you got a tree that's rotting out. And uh, the question is, if it's a small tree, uh, you can probably let it go until it falls over. And if it's a big tree, you may want to cut it down before it causes damage. Okay, you wrap that up just perfectly. <laughs> thank you folks so much for watching. And I want to thank the three of you for your expertise and show and tells. We always love that. You have a great week gardening. See you next time. Bye-bye.